Okay, so something recently dawned on me and it's that I've never actually covered solid principles. I've done lots of other object-oriented principles. I've done design patterns and various things like that, but never actually covered solid. I have done it in like blog format, which I've sent out to my mailing list, but never on video. And so let's give it a go. Here, what we're going to do is because of solid principles, the kind of... I'd say misunderstood or also they're not easy to understand because of the way that they're written. The descriptions sometimes don't make perfect sense. And so your understanding and my understanding of some solid principles might be close, but we might be sort of missing sort of fundamental understandings of what problems they are trying to solve. And that's the approach I'm going to take in these. I'm going to work backwards from the actual problems that the solid principles exist to solve and then at the end of it what we'll do is we'll revisit the name or revisit the description and say can we reword it do we understand what this actually means now and so we'll take a single responsibility as an example and what I mean in practice is that we'll have a look at the wording but then we'll switch our focus mainly to the problem that it's trying to solve We'll have a look and add an example and we'll also either include a solution or we'll have a look at a prevention. And also, just as an added bonus, we'll try and solve these or prevent these using some design patterns. So uh, quite a lot to learn there, quite a lot of cool stuff that we're going to cover. Let's start with the single responsibility principle. So you may see two different wordings for this. The one that I've seen the most is this one, a class should have only one reason to change. And then I've seen another one, uh, which is this, a module should be responsible to one and only one actor. Neither of those is any more clearer than the other. A class should have only one reason to change, to change its underwear, to change the world, to look in the mirror and make that change. It's really not clear. And that's why there's so much sort of ambiguity and misunderstanding between developers as to what single responsibility means. So I'm going to show you the problem it solves and then we'll come up with a solution, uh, a prevention or a solution. And then we'll also have a little discussion about what single responsibility does not mean because uh, I've seen people band around um, the word single responsibility or the phrase single responsibility for scenarios which aren't actually breaches of single responsibility. Here is the example that I'm going to demonstrate with. I've created this spend tracker class. Let's go and have a look. And it kind of does what it says on the tin. It tracks a user's spending. We have a max budget property. We have a current spending property. And then most of the action takes place in this track spending method, which receives an amount. It bumps the user's current spending by that amount. And if the current user's, or if the user's current spending then exceeds the max budget, it notifies them that their budget limit is exceeded. So there's nothing that we've seen there that would say that we're breaching single responsibility here. I think it's totally reasonable uh, to be able to notify a user that they've exceeded a budget limit in a class which is designed to track spending. Just because a method or a class does more than one thing does not mean that they've breached the single responsibility principle. But if the class has more than one reason to change, and we'll come to that wording in a minute, then it is breaching the single responsibility principle. And ours does have more than one reason to change here because the way that we're actually sending that notification is all handled by the actual spend tracker itself. And so here, if you see we're using a mailer, which we are injecting into a spend tracker. If for whatever reason it is decided that notifications are going to be sent by some other means, for example, SMS, and I have created an SMS dispatcher, then what that means is that this class has a reason to change. If, for example, the track spending mechanism was going to use floats instead of ints, or it was going to include currency as well as an amount, then you would have another reason for this class to change. Because we are looking at two responsibilities. We're looking at the responsibility of actually handling the amount of current spending and making comparisons, but we're also handling the mechanism for sending notifications. The sin here isn't 
in actually sending the notification, it's actually handling all the mechanics of sending that notification. So let's go and make this change now. In fact, before we do that, I'm just gonna run the test because this is all under test. If we go and run this, the tests are passing. However, if I go and make the changes, it means I'm going to need to go and make changes to my tests for my spend tracker class, which needn't be changed if they were isolated away in their own class with its own single responsibility of handling the notification. Okay, so let's go make the change. Here, we're gonna say we're not going to send it using the mailer, we're going to use the SMS dispatcher. And so down here, we're saying this dispatcher dispatch. Let's go and run the tests again. So now we have broken tests for our spend tracker. Spend tracker construct argument number one dispatcher must be of type app SMS dispatcher. So we're already creating a break which needn't really have existed. So let me show you how we could have avoided this. Instead of actually injecting our SMS dispatcher or our mailer or whatever, what we would do is we would have a notifier object or a notifier class which does all the handling and if anything needs to change regarding the handling of sending the message, that change takes place in the notifier. So inside of source, I'm gonna create a class called notifier and then it is here where we're going to inject the parts that we need. So for example, SMS dispatcher, and then we'll have a function called notify. So notifier notify with a string message. And then we'll say this dispatcher dispatch message. Okay, so if we go back to our spend tracker here now, all we need to, or all that the spend tracker needs to know or needs to receive is just a notifier. And then we can get rid of this notify method completely and just say, this notifier notify. And then if the methodology changes for actually sending a notification, we're making the changes or the changes are isolated to our notifier class and nothing will actually need to change here. So let's go ahead and do that. So here, we're just gonna make this change to mailer. All of those changes have been handled by the notifier. If we just go over to our tests, and then here, instead of mocking the mailer, what we'll do is we shall mock the notifier instead. Mockery mock notifier. And instead of the notifier expecting send mail, it's just expecting notify. Let's run the test and see how we get on. Okay, so we have a passing test. And if you remember what we said at the very beginning when we talked about what problem that we're trying to solve here, we we'll saw God objects, tight coupling and change chains. Focusing in on change chains there, not only do we not have to make any changes to our spend tracker if we decide that we're gonna change the way the notifications are sent, but also our spend tracker test is not dependent on any kind of object which is responsible for sending notifications. We're now just receiving a notifier, and so if any of that mechanism changed behind the scenes, we do not need to touch this test. This test will now run and pass forever whilst our spend tracker is handling only one responsibility. So let's wrap up. At the beginning, we said that the definitions were these. A module should be responsible to one and only one actor. A class should have only one reason to change. They're still confusing definitions. However, we now know what problems we're trying to solve. We've had a look at that problem and solved it ourselves. Hopefully now we both understand single responsibility principle better than what we did at the start. Let's move on. In fact, just before we wrap up on this, at the beginning I said that I'd also cover uh, some of the things which single responsibility is not. So here are some common misconceptions. These are probably the most common ones, and they are a class should do one job. This is false. A class should have one clear responsibility, but that can incorporate all different jobs into that. A method should only do one thing. Again, very common, just because a method might fire off a notification as well as increment uh, a spending amount then that is perfectly fine it falls within the responsibility of tracking a budget and cohesion equals 
coupling again just because we've injected a class a notifier uh, which is going to send notifications when a particular uh, limit is exceeded that doesn't mean that we have some tight coupling the notifier is a cohesive part of this unit it's an important part of tracking spending is letting the person know that their spending is being tracked but we're not coupled to it because if we need to change the way that the notification is being sent that is all hidden away inside of the notifier class and nothing needs to change in this spend tracker so we can't say that we have tight coupling so you'll hear other misconceptions and other fallacies regarding single responsibility or other misunderstandings but these are the main ones i think we have a good understanding of what it is and what it isn't now